Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. Great day for hockey. Got a mm-hmm. game tonight, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All righty, Bruce. We've got 10 Oilers games. Nine Oilers wins. Pretty impressive. And and if someone had said that after, what was it, game three, that Mike Smith would get injured and the Oilers would have nine wins in uh, ten games, I don't think very many people would have made that bet. No. Yet we, yet we see it. What do you make of it, Bruce? What's, what is, your, like, you, if you have one or two takeaways about why this is happening, what would you say? Oh. Uh... Well, I'm just doing a 10-game segment review right now, uh, and it's like none that we've seen really in the uh, the cult of hockey era, you know. Uh, we've been yeah. doing these since 2010, and the only one that ever came close was uh, the second segment of last season uh, when the Oilers were bouncing back from a tough start, and they went 8-2-0, and and they outscored their opposition 42-26. to and this time around, they're nine one and zero, and have outscored their opposition forty four to twenty eight. So there's a little bit of comparisons there. But of course, this is the first ten games. It's the first time the Oilers have ever started with nine wins in their first ten games. Uh, they've had. Uh, I went back into history, and I found out that the uh, that the NHL's greatest team of the century, the eighty four eighty five Oilers, started off eight zero and two for a similar eighteen points. And uh, they, uh, they, of course, didn't have shootouts, so they had to settle for a 2-2 tie in their opener, whereas this year's team was able to win an extra point in the shootout. But And that team outscored their opponents by a measly 61-25. to 25. I mean, they were just unreal. Yeah. But uh, anyways, th- there's no point in really making that comparison, other than there are things in common. These guys are finishers, uh, and they are... Uh, uh, they're running a PDO of uh, uh, 1.05 to this point, meaning their shooting percentage is 5% higher than their opponents. And largely, you know, the goalies have been good, but uh, largely it's been the Oilers scoring on an extraordinary percentage of their shots, 13.3%, which is uh, phenomenal in this day and age. And they're just generating high danger chances, and they're particularly generating them and finishing them on the power play, which has been exceptional. They've, they've scored 15 power plays and 30 opportunities. And according to Natural Stat Trick, the Oilers are scoring over 21 goals per 60 on the power play, and the next best team in the league is at 12. Like, it's just they're on a completely other level from the entire rest of the NHL. Have been for two years, but uh, in the early stages, and obviously some of this is going to level out to some degree. They're not going to run 50% all year, but they are uh, they have every chance of being the best power play in the league all year long and with a, with, you know, with a margin. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge advantage for Edmonton. They're just break even, 5-on-5, five 23-4, five, 21 against. And by our counts, at 5-on-5, five 95 five, uh, high, uh, what we call uh, grade-A shots, to 91 for the other team. So pretty level, five on five, but it's the power play where despite playing uh, uh, considerably less time, like 42 minutes with the power play to 53 on the penalty kill, Oilers have generated 39 grade A shots on the power play and they've only allowed 22. Like that's a massive difference. And the both wow. special teams contributing to that and, uh, and uh, getting the job done. And even the shorthanded units uh, contributed three high danger chances and a goal. So I don't so, know if the shot shot analytics crowd is worried about the Oilers right now or bringing this up as a point. Um, mm-hmm. But what what I would say is the Oilers, in terms of what they're generating in grade A chances and giving up in terms of grade A shots, mm-hmm. um, it, it kind of matches the goals they're scoring. There's it's yeah. not out of whack according to what we're seeing track in mm-hmm. every game it's 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 aligned like this is that's how many goals roughly they should have and that's how many goals roughly they should have given up and um so i'm not seeing anything alarming right now we're seeing a team that um 
allows a lot of outside shots. It's part of Dave. If, if you ever listen to Dave Tippett or his assistant coaches talk about their strategy on the PK and at even strength, the whole strategy is give up outside shots, even give them the zone, don't, guard the middle of the ice, guard the middle of the ice, guard the middle of the ice. That's what they do. They don't want to have great A shots against them. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're willing to give up outside shots. Tippett himself has said he sees... 10 shots a game as giveaways. Hmm. And he's talking about, uh, that's what he wants the other team to do. He wants them to give away the puck by having an easy outside shot on net that the goalie will trap for a face off or deflect to his teammates. So the others can break out. That's their, that's actually their strategy is to give up those outside shots on a certain level. I mean, really the strategy is not to give up the inside shots, but you have to give up somewhere and that's what they're doing. So, It's working. It's, uh, you know, you you can't score goals, Bruce, from the corners. You can't score goals, generally speaking, unless you're Leon Dreisaitl. You can't (laughs) score goals from, you don't score that many goals from the points either. Like you do score now and then, right, on the deflected point shot. But I I like the strategy. I think on the PK, it's brilliant Mm -hmm. what they do. Um, They, they, because we've seen a changing cast of characters over the years with PK, constantly changing but the same yeah. high results. So he's, it's, yeah. that seems to be a structure thing and a, and the, the, and a, and a coaching thing, a teaching thing. They can take players, teach them a system and it's working repeatedly, repeatedly with all these different guys. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, and the, the other factor in them winning Bruce is Koskinen. I mean, this is the other really surprising thing is he's played very well uh, in most of his games. Um, he's had a few mm-hmm. clankers, a few clanker goals against, but he's done well. Well, both Koskinen and Smith are dead even at 920 save percentage, and that's a real nice number. Isn't so, it? <laughs> yeah. When you got both your goalies uh, pitching uh, 92%, uh, you're in good shape, and especially when you've got the, uh, you know, the high-end scoring talent at the other end uh, of the sheet. And another thing about the shots, David, is score effects. The Oilers have led yeah. for 325 minutes. Uh, out of the 600 and small change that they've played over 10 games. And they've only trailed for 102 minutes. And many of those were last the last game against New York Rangers, where the Oilers had to come back three different times. And in that game, when score effects were on the other side, the Oilers outshot the Rangers handily, 39-25. But a lot of games, Edmonton's holding the lead, and the other team is, is uh, you know, firing shots from everywhere, and the Oilers will get a chance going the other way, and they'll turn it into a good chance and uh, occasionally stick it in the net. So uh, sometimes the uh, a poor shots rate uh, actually turns into a higher uh, um, higher um, percentage, like a higher PDO, um, just because of the nature of how the game is played, where the team on the counterattack gets fewer shots but better shots. And that's uh, uh, that's been the Oilers' game on on many nights. And then there's that power play, which is just off the charts, unreal. So we're not going to get into a player by player breakdown here mm-hmm. of the first ten games. You're going to do that in your in your post, yes. which is this. Uh, so, but what we will talk about is some recent uh, news out of the yep. Oilers. Um, the first is that Mike Smith is going on the road trip, but he's not mm-hmm. getting in the first game. It doesn't look like and. So this is stretched out to about, what, three weeks so far? They thought it might yep. be a week. And, of course, this was everybody's concern heading into last season. Yep. Um, it was, it's, it's uh, you know, it's the Oilers fans. I think our worst nightmare for this year is Smith being out for an extended period, other than McDavid or Dry Settle being out, maybe Nurse. But, I mean, that, that goes without saying. But it's like the, the, the expected nightmare, the thing we were all thinking is probably going to happen is Smith's going to get injured and he's going to be out for a while. And now we're, now we're kind of, faced it but they've weathered it because of Koskinen. and nonetheless bruce this is getting it's, worse it's until skinner steps up until skinner plays some games and also shows that he can get in like a 910 save percentage right like that he can stay above 900 at least mm-hmm. you know hopefully around 910 for a backup goalie there's worry here. there's real worry here because the cost can't play every game and um Which it's a little bit troubling proven. It's a little troubling here with Smith. It's, it's dragging on. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I was thinking a little bit Saturday night when they or Friday night when they won that game against the Rangers on the Kevin Lowe retirement night, and I, I cast my mind back. I didn't mention this in that podcast, but I will now. The Glenn Sather banner night when the Rangers came here in the 2015-16 season. And I think Sather at that point had just finally kicked himself upstairs to, uh, you know, Poho as opposed to the active GM of the Rangers. And so they decided that was the time to do it. Well, Connor McDavid was hurt. That was his rookie season. And Drysaddle and Taylor Hall were doing all the heavy lifting for the Oilers. And they won that similarly exciting game 7-5. to five against New York Rangers um, with uh, that was the game that Anders uh, um, Nilsson, uh, the Swedish goalie monster um, that had such a hot start for the orders that year. And it just it won a series of games with fantastic goaltending. And in that game, you could almost visibly see the wheels falling off of Nilsson's game. And he started letting in bad goals and it just, he's, the Oilers blew, I think, a 5-3 lead and, and uh, in the third. And only a brilliant play by a young Drysaddle to Hall uh, turned the tide and the Laurie Korpakoski's hat-trick goal into the empty net. I mean, these were the days, right? But uh, uh, that was, and that team soon thereafter uh, kind of went on a plummet because they uh, they didn't get the, uh, they weren't getting the net mining anymore. So that's, you know, that, that's where you certainly want to have your main two guys both available. And Smith, you know, I don't know what he's battling. Is it a groin? Whatever it is, three weeks tomorrow that he got hurt. And uh, uh, and so far he has not, you know, as so much as suited up for a game since then. Yeah. I mean, the good, the good news is Koskinen did play well an entire season once, 29-20. Oh. Um, he's had good leagues, good years in other leagues, full seasons. So it, if he's he can be he can be a decent goalie, a good goalie. I mean, he came close to a nine twenty per save percentage for an entire season. I think he was at nine seventeen, yeah, uh, twenty nine twenty. So twenty nineteen twenty. So he, it's not unexpected. The question is, can Skinner step up? I think and right. and and provide relief. And then if that can happen, then Smith can take all the time he needs to get better. Like you know. Take it easy, man. But we we're gonna need some, to see some games from Skinner, and we might see that this week. They play. Uh, they have a back to back, don't they? What Tuesday, night, Thursday, it? Friday, Sunday, and next Tuesday is a five game and eight day road trip. There's no way one goalie's gonna play all those games. So certainly the back to back. I don't imagine that. Even Dave Tippett, with his reliance on veterans, would would consider going with uh, Koskinen in both games if Smith isn't ready. Skinner will surely play in one of those. And I mean that's part of the equation is Dave Tippett has got to got to be prepared to say, I'm gonna go with my number two goalie, second best goalie that I have available, whether it's a veteran or not, and give Skinner a fighting chance. And I mean the Oilers have got I've got enough of a cushion now in the early going. I mean, they don't have to win every single game, even though obviously that's your objective every single night. But you have to take a little bit of a long term balance view. To me, Mikko Koskinen is fine as long as he's playing two games a week. As soon as you start getting into him playing three, four games a week because the schedule is heavy and you don't have another goalie you trust, then that's when he's run into trouble in the past on two different occasions. Yeah, I think you'd like to see Skinner play. Like if it's just Skinner and Koskinen, let's say on this road trip, you'd want to see Skinner in two of two of the five mm-hmm. games would be ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the defense is yeah. the defense is rounding out. Barry's playing a better a better game recently Tyson Berry is and he, he he like I like Evan Bouchard a lot on the top pairing but it's acceptable to have Barry make that move because he has been playing very well he's gotten his game together after a really atrocious start to the season he's he's played pretty he's played strong hockey and yeah. CeCe and Keith have calmed down a bit I think and are playing they've they've been okay but I've I've liked them more recently and I think they're they're starting to work together uh, um, even better so Bruce um, the changes at forward line, we see Cassian moving up and Yamamoto moving down. Cassian moving up to play with Nugent Hopkins and Hyman on the second line. Yamamoto to the third line with Fogel and Ryan. What What's your take on that? Oh, I think it's possibly a move to try and... Uh, it's not so much a demotion for Yamamoto. It's actually been pretty good, you know. The last few games in particular, he finally got off the schneid. He's got a couple goals. He's plus four on the season, playing uh, 
uh, primarily second line, be it with Drysaddle or Nugent Hopkins. Um, Cassian had a great start, you know, and after four games, he had three goals, two assists, points in every game. Uh, he had something like um, 23 hits in four games. He was plus one. And the five games since then, Bupkis, no points, minus four, only 13 hits, uh, you know, and, and, you know, so his hit rate sort of cut in half. And his involvement rate is, I think you could kind of measure it the same way. He's, it seems like he's after that really good start. Uh, I won't say tuned out, but uh, you know he's just certainly dropped a couple of notches in in his in his exuberance and in his overall play. And so maybe they're thinking we want to get him involved somehow. And uh, <clears throat> we you know with the new Jin Yamamoto on the same line in the top six. Uh, that's, you know, that's not a heavy line. I've got Hyman, who's, you know, he's, he's a bigger guy, but I don't know that I'd call him a, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a grinder on the puck, but he's, he's not a, uh, 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 uh big physical guy. And maybe they, that's that they want to just shake up that mix a little bit. And at the same time, maybe Yamamoto can in, infuse a little bit better defensive play on the third line, which has been bleeding goals against. Well, this is a good thought, Bruce. Like people can see this. You could see this as a promotion, demotion kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or you could see it as Dave Tippett thinking, okay, we're going into some tough games here. We need a functional checking line. Mm -hmm. I can't have my worst defensive winger on my checking line. And Bruce, according to way, the way we're looking at it, and like on terms of major mistakes on grade A chances against, mm -hmm. Cassian is by far the worst defensive winger this year on the Oilers. He, he consistently doesn't make plays that other wingers are making. He doesn't get to go to the puck. He doesn't do the right reads in the defensive zone. He doesn't back check quite as smartly. Like he, I think the effort is there, mm -hmm. but the, you know, the, the reading of the game and the feet moving and, and all those other things aren't there at the same level as other wingers on the owners, but the best winger, the, the player who has made the fewest mistakes on uh grade a shots against is Kyler Yamamoto. And again, these are trends that we've seen over the years. Yamamoto yeah. has consistently been at the lower end of making these kinds of mistakes. Cassian's consistently the highest or at the highest, uh, near the highest end for making these kind of mistakes oh. over a number of years. So you're Dave Tippett and you're thinking, I need a check in line. This is not working. I have this guy, Yamamoto, who can score, but we really need to show, we need, I need someone I can trust to send out there against these top lines of these other teams. What are we going to do? This isn't a bad solution. In fact, this is the best solution towards doing that. Because Ryan has been solid enough defensively. Um, I think, you know, according to our numbers, he's been their best defensive center in terms of him and Drysettle are tied. They've both <clears> been <throat> strong in their own zone, generally speaking. And Warren Fogel's been okay. You know, he's got a fairly high rate of mistakes as well. So he hasn't been great, but he's been okay. So, um, yeah, I could see Tippett doing this. As for Cassian moving up, you know, if you're going to play some tougher teams, a little heavier hockey, I'm not exactly sure what the makeup of these other teams are, you know, until you, until you see them play. But Cassian has had some success in the past on an offensive line. Yep. Nugent Hopkins is a smaller player, and I think he does thrive playing with bigger players. Hyman, Hyman is a big guy. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not small. He's a, big, he's a big forward. But Cassian's a really big forward, and he's nasty. Mm -hmm. So this could work. You could see this working because... Nugent Hopkins has, in, in Hyman, he has that super skilled player, like a really skilled hockey player who can make plays. He's got someone to work off of. And Cassian has his moments too on the attack. So the it's not going to be like with Yamamoto there, but it could work out. The question is, can Hyman and, and Nugent Hopkins cover up for Cassian's defensive deficiencies? Hyman is a super defensive hockey player. And Nugent has been okay since paired with him. They work, they work well together. So they can probably get by um, in they might have kind of the soft minutes roll. If you, if you roll the top line and the sure. um, on the road and the, and the Ryan line against the really tough competition, mm -hmm. then you can save Nugent Hopkins. Maybe they can slide them in against some third pairing, third lines and third pairing D and uh, that's going to work as well. So the more I think of it, actually, the more I like the move, I think it, uh, it could help the Oilers in a pretty tough patch of games here. Yeah, well, if you, I mean, we we look more granularly at uh, at scoring chances and and uh, grade A shots. 
but just the old plus minus flaws and all. Um, but for the uh, third line, uh, Warren Fogle minus four, Derek Ryan minus four, tied for worst on the team. Uh, Zach Cassian minus three. And that was that was with those guys scoring. Like they had a five game streak where they scored yeah. at least one goal in every game. And once the scoring dried up, the, you know, they were giving up goals even while they were scoring and they're still giving up goals. So I can see where it would be a priority for Tippett to maybe change the mix. And he first tried by putting Devin Shore into the middle on that third line, not a great defensive center. And then, no. of course, he got hurt right away. So uh, uh, he's out now, what they say, four to six weeks. So uh, now the uh, Tippett's, he sort of has to go back to Ryan as the 3C. I don't think Ryan McLeod that he just called up is, is going to get put right into the 3C role. But um, Derek Ryan will be, so he's switching it up and he's partnering him with his uh, Kyle Yamamoto, which Ryan and Yamamoto as a penalty killing duo have been very good together. And now they're going to get a chance to to work on that chemistry at even strength. So it's you can see where where he's thinking at least. Yeah, I and we don't we don't we're just guessing, right? We're speculating, but when I first saw this Bruce I didn't like it, right? Cuz I, you know, I'm a big fan of the dynamite line. I think it's right. having the second scoring line is a great thing and they, but they have already broken up the dynamite line. But I've liked the Yamamoto Nugent Hopkins Hyman line. Excellent mm-hmm. line, I think. So I was negative when I first saw it. I'm thinking, why are they doing that like Cassie and like he's just he's playing poorly, but this is why they're doing it. They're trying to get just, they need another line they can feed against tough competition. And I think they realize they can't do that. They can't count on Ryan and Fogel and Cassian against tough competition. They're going to get beat consistently on goals against. So uh, the more I think of it in those terms, shoring up the checking line, I really, I I like this move. I'm 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 on board with it. I think it's a good idea. And although Cassian's not a great second line uh, winger in the NHL, he's he's kind of okay at it. Um, and you can't. I was thinking, why didn't they move Fogel there? Well, it's because Fogel's a better defensive two-way player than Cassian, and they need this line that can that can shut down other other teams. And you know, the you just mentioning the Ryan Yamamoto connection, it makes it easier to you have those guys out there on the PK, and then you. you your lines aren't as much flux after the PK because right. they're they're tired at the same rate. Fogel's also a PK guy, so this could work out, bit. Bruce. This this might work. This might be a good move. The other move is Shore. Um, did you have something you wanted to add there? No, nope. go for it. Okay, Shore is the Shore's out for four to six weeks. Um, again, I think Devin Shore is an okay fourth line winger. He's not a strong fourth line or third line center because his defensive reads aren't great. He's more of a, a he's more of like a hustle energy player all over the ice, um, mm-hmm. fast, has a little bit of skill, but he's not a great defensive hockey player, generally speaking, um, at even strength. When it, those, those are difficult, complex reads a center has yeah. to make. He's not up to it. So anyway, he's out for four to six weeks with a lower body injury and um, called up as Ryan McLeod for mm-hmm. his a really huge opportunity for him here for, for this player. He's, a, I think he's 22 now and um, he's had a couple cup of, cups of coffee in the NHL already. And he did well last spring or wh- whenever that was, so whenever the season, you know, in the final games of last season, I might've been running into the summer. I keep, it's always a little complicated. And then he uh, didn't do well in preseason. Bruce, what do you make of McLeod being called up? Well, he's got, um, uh, he's got a second chance, and you know, through injury, he was always going to be the first call up. And certainly, with a bottom six pivot going down, he was the only choice, really. I think from uh, from yeah. the uh, minor league level, uh, he's done uh, one goal, four assists, and five game, uh, five points in seven games in Bakersfield. So, not quite his point per game output as last year, but at least he's got a little bit of offense going down there. My concern about him is he's shown zero offensive acumen as a NHL player uh, in 10 games to end last season, four playoff games, two games to start this season, one point. And that was a puck that bounced off of him and went to the goal scorer, basically. It wasn't really a, a play with his stick or anything like that. And a couple times he came close, but there, there's not much offense there. Uh, I do see some... 
um, signs of a very good defensive player. And certainly, uh, you know, he's, his uh, transition game in terms of getting the puck out of his zone into the other team's zone and into good places is good. It's like, you know, he's really good between the 20-yard lines. And the question is, what does he do in the red zones? And uh, he's going to get another another good, hard uh, look because, they you know, they don't have a lot of options. I think he'll be playing center. I mean, their other options are to move Nugent Hopkins to center and go with the center's three model uh, plus Ryan or to move Kyle Turris back into the middle. And I have a pretty good idea how you're going to be feeling about that. Yeah, there you go. Base bomb. So Ryan McLeod is it, and he's going to be called up, and he's going to be in the lineup. I think we'll see him playing next game. And uh, it's a huge opportunity for him, and hopefully he will have uh, taken something away from this, what should be a wake-up call, that after making such big steps last year, he, he took a step backward, and he had a poor preseason and two relatively poor games, and he was on his way out. And hopefully that's... Uh, uh, you know, just a, a he will have taken that as an opportunity to recharge the batteries and refocus the energy and uh, bring his best game this time around. I wouldn't be surprised, given Tippett's proclivity for veterans, to see Turris at center on the fourth line or Colton Sevier even. Sevier's played some center, I think. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see either of those things ahead of McLeod. I want to see McLeod. Um, here's what I would say about McLeod, Bruce. I think he's got to do three things this time that he didn't do all the time in preseason. We both agree that he's actually surpri- he surprised me. I don't know if he surprised you. He surprised me with his defensive play. Um, I thought he did a good job of something that Torres consistently has failed at, covering players in the defensive slot. He has stopped on them at the, in the NHL. like so, so like he doesn't fly by them. He stops on them mm-hmm. and he covers them. And he's aware of them. And he did a he he did an at least an adequate job in that job, which is a really hard job. That's not easy because you know you're tempted, you know, you, you need to help out the defenseman in the corners. You gotta you are looking to advance the puck. You know, a lot of players are thinking, I want to get that puck in offense, offense, offense. But he's he 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 showed some patience and some skill in reading the game and covering those players. He, he's gotta keep doing that. So I think that's actually that's the baseline for a fourth line center in the NHL is doing that job. And he can, mm-hmm. he can do that. So I'm actually, I'm confident that putting him in the game, but to stay in the NHL, he's got to do two other things. And the first thing is something you noted a number of times in the preseason, he gets in on the four check and he hits nobody. He, he hardly uses his body on the, he's a, what is he? Six, two, two, ten. He's this great, big, fast guy. He's got to engage physically. He's got to get, you know, what's, what's the old saying? Inside their sweaters, the old McClellan line. Like he's got to, he's, he doesn't have to plaster them against the boards necessarily, but he must use his body more to puck protect, to to engage physically, to rough players off the puck, to, you know, to use some force to get them off the puck. And yeah, if he does actually hit a few players hard, bonus, because he's a big guy. That's not his game. Maybe if he wants to be an NHL hockey player, but he, he's got the speed and the size and, and, the defensive play, I think, to be a thousand game NHL or like there's players like him who have played a thousand games in the NHL with what he has to offer. But all mm-hmm. of them, all of them get really involved in the physical play, I think. Like they're all they're all that covered off with that. The last thing he's got to do is when he gets the puck, I, I thought he was he he's lacking confidence right now when he gets the puck to go for it. The worst thing for him to do is to come up and not go for it, not bring his A game to kind of hold back, be tentative. He's just got to make up his mind when he gets that puck. Cause he's done this at other levels, including the AHL. When he gets the puck, he's going to try to make a play. He's going to go for it. He's going to try to score a goal. He's going to be a playmaker. He's not going to be a pa- like a panic guy who gives up the puck. And it's just like out of desperation, almost he's got to do this because being cautious and tentative hasn't worked. Might as well go for it. Might as well carry that puck, try to make a play try to take it hard to the net because the other stuff, the underconfident approach isn't working. So just to make up your mind, okay, no matter what I'm doing it, I'm taking that puck and I'm going. Cause I had, I didn't see that in, in uh, at least not this last time when he, in the preseason and in right. his first two games this year. Yeah. Well, to your first point, he has five hits and 10, 10 NHL, sorry. in uh, sorry, 16 NHL games counting the playoffs, five hits. So that's 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 a very low 
total for basically any player. Yeah. Uh, certainly regular player. And for a bottom sixer, it's exceptionally low. Like, and I'm with you. You don't have to be a masher, uh, but you got to get down and dirty and and get involved in those puck battles and finish your check once in a while. And uh, you know, not pass up the free hits, which I've seen him do, where you know you got just like I say, finish your check. It's pretty fundamental to hockey, and always has been. And it doesn't come naturally to him. And he, you know, he's going to. to uh, to um, have to make progress there. And the thing is about him, that's been basically the knock on him from day one, right? When he fell from being a first round talent into the second round of the draft, and people were saying, how do we get this guy so late? And he read the scouting reports and the one after another he said, uh, uh, perimeter player, uh, doesn't get down and dirty, you know, th- those are kind of the negative things. And the other, uh, Otherwise, surrounded by positives, he's big, he's fast, he can skate, he's got good hands, you know, he's got a lot going on. And there's that one missing element. And uh, uh, let's hope that uh, that uh, Dave Tippett and Glenn Gulitson and company can uh, uh, can start to bring that out of him. Because with that speed and size, there's no reason why he shouldn't be an effective physical player. And and it's fascinating, Bruce, like the, cause he's a young man, right? Like he, he yep. and he's got this career ahead of him. And if he, if he can find a way to up that physical play to actually do this, I mean, this is a 20, $30 million decision for him to make. Is he going to commit to physical play at the NHL level and all the pain and, you know, guts that takes, mm-hmm. which is immense, right? It's immense. The amount of pain and guts that's going to take to do that over a 10 year you know, NHL career, just, you just like, I, I'm sure that most people would quail if they, if they knew how much courage you have to get, have and how much physical suffering you're going to have to endure to play the, the game that well. That's why they, so few people do it. Even people with immense hockey talent. So, but it is a 20 to $30 million decision on his part. That's how much he's going to make if he can have that kind of career where he's in the NHL for 10 years, which we've seen other players with similar skill sets achieve. Um, so uh, there's a lot, there's a lot riding on it and maybe they could frame it that way for him. Uh, you know, that's a lot, a lot of money that you can mm-hmm. earn. If you play the game this way, do you want to do it or not? You decide. Uh, here's what Jay Woodcroft said on orders now about him. Cause I didn't see, I haven't watched the HL this year yet. And I don't know if you have, so I haven't seen him I play. Have. Here's what Jay Woodcroft said on, uh, to Bob Stoffer on orders now last week, quote on Ryan McLeod, quote, his gifts speak for themselves. You know it, you can see it. He's somebody with great feet, great legs, the speed through the middle of the rink. He's playing over 20 minutes a night since he's been out down here. What we're trying to do to work on with Ryan is to stay in plays longer. And what I mean offensively when the puck goes to the net is not go past that traffic area, but to stop, to get his nose over the puck, to burrow. I like that, to burrow, to find rebounds, that kind of thing offensively, but also defensively. And what I mean by that is if the t- other team lays the puck in and they got to stop on a four check, they touch it first for whatever reason, they get a stoppage, to not glide past or glide through the battle, but to stop on that puck, to support the defender who is in duress. Finally, he says, we are encouraging him to shoot the puck more, to think shot first. So so this is the this is the $30 million decision for Ryan yeah. to do these, listen to coach, and yeah. have that automatically, like uh-huh. a religion, a fanatical cult, where you stop on the puck, stop and start, dig in there on the attack, go to the net and just burrow in there head first, you know, stick first like Brian Smith and fight for the puck. Like another center with a similar skill set, Craig McTavish, who took a while to develop as a as an NHL hockey player, but in the end became this really, you know, had great stick handling, skating puck skills, but in the end became this guy who dug in there and, and you know, did burrow constantly for pucks in the corner in front of the net, wherever it was. He was there fighting for it. That's what McLeod has to do. Yeah, well, Woodcroft basically put in in, in probably more eloquent words than we did, but the same issues. Yeah, uh, I love Jay Woodcroft. I got to say, he's won me over. Uh, I great, think he's a great coach me. at the at the uh, uh, top affiliate level at minimum and with the future. Uh, I, I love how he he always 
comes across uh, saying positive things about players, and when he criticizes them, as he did here, it's constructive criticism. This is what we want to see him doing. We know he can do it. He, you know, just needs reps and and so on. And all of those uh, all of those criticisms he made are absolutely valid to what I've seen by eye of this player, which admittedly isn't a lot. I mean, he's below the radar. He's only played the 16 NHL games, and I've seen him play handfuls of other contests. But uh, uh, there are things where you say, oh, if only he would do this, he could, you know, he could really emerge at the next level. Now, if I was not Jay Woodcroft, but um, uh, Dave Tippett, uh, and I don't know if they even still do roommates on the road or if they all have their own separate rooms. I would put him with Colton Sevier and say, listen to your roommate talk about how he survived for 500 games in the NHL after playing almost five full years in the AHL just to make it here. And the price that, that he's had to pay to uh, to carve out that uh, that career in the NHL. You know, think, stuff of that nature, or sit next to him at the team meal or what have you you know not necessarily say well i want you to listen to everything Connor mcdavid says because it's you know they're they're not comparable on so many levels this is what you're going to need to do to be a successful bottom sixer and maybe more once you can establish yourself there so i was thinking the same thing but i always had a different player in mind uh okay. bruce Derek ryan okay fair enough um who came up the hard way right I sure did. Came same, the hard same. Day. <laughs> and now has uh, career earnings of oh, earnings, sorry. 13 million. I'm just reading this. I don't know if that's accurate or not. If he's past oh. that. I think he might be past that. But he's, you know, more than 10 million, approaching 20 million, I'm guessing. And he, he never made it till age 29. That's right. So he... He, and he's they're similar kind of finesse fast finesse players McLeod's a lot bigger so uh that's another guy that he could yep. that he could listen to here and um and learn from and as for Woodcroft he he strikes me what I liked about that is I think the best teachers are very um they just don't say hustle like mm -hmm. get into the corner and hustle and win that battle they actually say get into the corner you know stop on the puck <laughs> Um, well, Burrow's good, but you know, get, they tell you what to do with this. Here's where you put your stick. Here's how you put your skates. Here's how you align yourself with the player. Here's, he's a, he's a fantastic technical coach. Mm -hmm. And he, so he's like the instructor, the teacher mode of coach. And there's always been that kind of coach, you know, starting with, you know, Roger Nielsen comes to mind, but there's coaches before him and after him, like who are these mm -hmm. fantastic, like the best college university level instructor you ever had. Right. And um, teaching a highly technical um, set of skills. He he strikes me, and the whole crew down in Bakersfield strike me as able to do that. You know, they're not they're necessarily the rah-rah motivator or the, mm -hmm. the you know, the hard-ass kicker kind of coach mm -hmm. uh, that we often see in the NHL. But uh, Wood, Woodcroft, I think, is perfect for the AHL and, you know, will one day be that kind of coach can also have has success at the NHL level. And I think Jay Woodcroft would be in line for that one day as well. Bruce, any final thoughts on the roster moves or the Oilers before we. Oh, well, they're, they're entering a new phase of their, their season. It's kind of, we kind of nice. We got a break after game five when they were five and oh, and we got another little break here three days when the, after 10, when they're nine and one, well, the next five are, all in uh, a hostile barns in a short eight-day span. Uh, a lot of earlier starts after so many, like 10, 8 p.m. or later starts here. We're, we're finally getting some of the 5 o'clock uh, neighborhood starts. And so a very different segment of the campaign. And I'm not expecting 9 and 1 in the next 10. But what's important is that they, you know, they maintain. You, you want to avoid any kind of of, uh, uh, of slide of any description. You know, if you lose a game, don't lose two. You know, as, as if you can stick to that, they're they're in great shape already. So uh, a, a very very promising uh, uh, opening of the season. Just to clarify, yeah, Derek Ryan, according to Cap Friendly, which I'll go with, has. Estimated career earnings to date, 11.6 million.
million dollars. So he's essentially, if he's wise with his money, set himself up for life. Ryan McLeod can do the same thing. So follow the money, Ryan. Follow the money because uh, it's there for you waiting. If you just if you do these things right, you, everything else is in, in aligned for this to happen. It just, but you know, sometimes like it took as we you know took Derek Derek Ryan a long time to to make that jump. It's asking a lot. Yeah. McLeod's always been this kind of swooping, you know, swooping player dominating the puck, able to take stick handle the puck through everybody, you know, the, at the lowest levels, even in the OHL, even in the AHL last year, you know, high flying offensive player in the end. Now he's got a completely different job, you know, something he has been working on at the AHL level, strong mm-hmm. defensive play for a number of years now with Woodcroft, mm-hmm. but he really does have a different job and uh, he's, he, but to earn that amount of money, that's what he's going to have to do to stick in the NHL. So we'll see what happens. Bruce, thanks for talking today. All right. Looking forward to getting back to game action uh, tomorrow, Tuesday night. And thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Bye now.